the snarl of a serial killer. Police officers who routinely arrest drunks and small-time offenders are about to hear the most chilling story of their lives. This has been arrested on suspicion of assault, assault, The man in front of them has been captured on video flaunting a crossbow, and worse. I'm authorising you to visit the police station because of the uh, allegation that you've assaulted somebody. I'm going to be interviewed about that matter. Do you understand that? Yeah, OK. Where is a sex worker that he's enticed back to his flat? A macabre place, a shrine to his heroes. On his walls, he had samurai swords. He had shelves of books on serial killers. It was like a den of dark arts. And a place that he has lured the woman in this picture. Her life is in the hands of a man with a terrifying ambition. He wanted to be celebrated for his accomplishments, but as, as a serial killer, so he sought infamy more than fame. As he embarks on his ambition to become a man who murders, can anyone get inside the mind of a serial killer? Susan Rushworth is alone on a street at night, cold, underdressed, but sweating, at once frightened that a man will approach her, yet anxious in case one does not. She feels desperately lonely, angry. It's like that when she needs a hit of heroin. According to her brother, she'll do what it takes to get cash to pay for it. I think she'll become more <laughs> devious in the way she try to get money off people. She was so desperate for cash, she'd do anything for money, shoplifting or revert to prostitution to feed her habit. Susan looks up, sees a familiar face. It is a man called Stephen Griffiths. Susan might have had two kinds of relationships with him. Some sex workers went in for a cup of tea, pick up drugs. Others went there to sell sex. She might have been one who did both. If she, like other sex workers, had been inside Griffith's den before, Susan will have endured an ugly ordeal. He would show them videos uh, featuring sadism towards women and read them passages from books about rape and mutilation and the murder of women. That night in June, she follows him, possibly suspicious, but unaware just how deeply disturbed he is. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. Misanthropic, a general hatred of humans. What will the misanthrope do to Susan Rushworth? She is to look into the eyes of a man who has ambitions. He wants to become a respected academic. His speciality subject is a dark one. Stephen Griffiths was actually a criminal psychologist and was doing a PhD. And the PhD was actually about the behavior of serial killers. Homicide in an industrial city like Bradford, where he is now, was the title of his PhD. The content served as a killer's training tool. What he did was off the scale. All of those women who come into his company find him disorientating, dangerous. They described him as incredibly controlling and unsettling. Once he'd given them money, he claimed the right to use them in any way he wanted. One woman said she felt less than human when she was with him. She was so relieved to get out of his flat. So you just sometimes you kill someone to kill yourself or kill parents. I don't know, I don't know. That's like deep issues inside me. Stephen Griffith's place on the list of infamous serial killers is guaranteed not simply because he killed three times, but because of his motive. He killed simply to become famous. I think it's pretty clear that the first offence he committed, he'd already planned and decided where he wanted to go. He wanted to be infamous. He wanted to kill a number of people. And there's no doubt that if he hadn't have been caught, he'd have gone and killed, I'm sure, many, many more until such time as he was caught. It is June in 2009 when Griffiths targets Susan Rushworth. She's vulnerable not the same girl her family had known. 
We had a really great life growing up. We played out most of the time. She was more like a tomboy. She wasn't like a sister. She was more like a brother. A happy childhood is followed by a conventional start to her adult life. She marries, but it doesn't work out. A series of partners follow, one of whom introduces her to the world of drugs. I think Susan started on uh, smoking marijuana to start with, and that hit wasn't good enough. So then she started on heroin and crack cocaine. Determined to get clean in the industrial city where she lives, she often returns to her family for encouragement to get better. One day, she disappears. Susan went missing the day after Father's Day in 2009, and it was a Monday. And she'd left my mother's house, saying she was going to go get a methadone from the chemist in Bradford, and that she'd be meeting back up with my mum in a, an hour or so if she collected the methadone. It wasn't the first time Susie had behaved this way. The family raise an alarm, but assume that Susan has returned to the streets to raise cash. The police were every bit as worried as everybody else, but um, sex workers do come and go. It's a transient trade. They might just have moved on to practice in another town. But as the days pass, there is no word. Susan Rushworth went missing, so her family held a press conference. Nothing happened. Nothing was heard from her. Had Susan come to any harm? There was no uh, clear evidence of foul play at the stage, so Griffiths was not suspected of anything. What has happened to Susan Rushworth? And what part has Stephen Griffiths played in the story? Stephen Griffiths lives in the heart of the very red light area of Bradford, West Yorkshire, where Susan Rushworth goes looking for business. As she does so, it is probable she meets Stephen, a regular user of sex workers. But it is highly unlikely she knows what's going on inside his damaged mind. So Griffiths had a real fascination, not just with, with homicide, which you know, he'd, he'd studied through his work with criminology, but actual serial killers. He was fascinated by the notoriety that went around them. He was fascinated by the fact that they'd be called certain names, that, that the press would be interested in them, that, that they would be elevated to almost a, a mythological status. Even though if they were, they were feared, this wasn't the point. He was fascinated by the presence that they could hold uh, over society as a whole. This was the man who had spotted Susan as she stood alone, isolated, on the street, looking for a customer. She was in plain sight of another addict. Stephen Griffiths was not hooked on drugs. He was addicted to murder. What had made Stephen Griffiths into the man who sees Susan that night? His troubled ways begin when he's 17. Griffiths attacks a store manager with a knife, an assault for which he's sentenced to three years. He was in fact diagnosed by a psychiatrist who actually raised the alarm bell, stating that this guy was seriously psychotic. Um, and someone that perhaps wasn't immediately amenable to treatment. So, you know, that, that history was there. In later interviews, he reveals an obsession with murder and is described as a schizoid psychopath. He holds a girl at knife point, receives another prison sentence, this time of two years. By 2005, now out of prison, Griffiths stars himself as an academic. He is admitted for a PhD at Bradford University, researching his favorite subject, killers. He was a, a deeply disturbed individual, obviously, uh, but on the outside, he seemed reasonably normal, bit of an oddball perhaps, but uh, generally not beyond the pale. Other students are in the dark about his past. He blends in. So here was a man with uh, deep psychological issues and nobody could really tell. Griffiths had partners, built relationships with fellow students, made friends like Delia Bartley Perry, who he'd met on the club scene. When I first got to know it, Steve, he was, he was really cheerful, you know, and he was always making jokes and, and having a laugh. Life as a student gave him lots of time to enjoy the local club scene. He posed like a matinee idol, it's kind of posed and preened for photographs. But he wasn't right with other people. 
Um, he didn't like people very much. And he, he, he made no bones about that he didn't like people. And generally, I don't think people liked him. They find him distant, menacing. He suffers mood swings around this time, a result, amongst other things, of his mental condition, one he was running risks with. So he is prescribed medication at the time, but the question is, is he taking it? Is he adhering to the treatment? And, and the suspicion from professionals around him was that probably not. And that fact might explain why his personality seemed to completely change. He seemed to get more serious and nastier and, and, and more angry. Stephen took offence very easily. He bore grudges. He wasn't an easy person to get along with. It was almost like as things were falling apart for him, those things were becoming more exaggerated. So his, his behaviour towards people be, was becoming more exaggerated. His fellow students did not know who they had in their midst. The medication had masked his menacing nature. As the terms passed, they moved on with their lives. Griffiths did not. By 2008, the diagnosed psychotic is spending long hours alone, sharpening weapons, honing his skills, and becoming morbidly intrigued by every aspect of the life of one of the subjects of his research project. Stephen Griffiths actually had a hero, and his hero was, was Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. He had book after book about him. He was someone who he studied incessantly, that he was very fascinated with and perhaps even idolised. In his flat, Griffiths is fighting demons. Around this time, he's reporting dark episodes. He believes that bugs are crawling through his brain and that this is affecting uh, his behaviour. He can hear them, so he's got auditory hallucinations, so he's putting cotton wool in his ears. So right now we begin to see a genuine thickening of the, of the psychosis that may have held him for a long time. Using evidence gleaned from interviews with Griffiths and from studying his methods, police have pieced together events of June 29th, 2009. Susan Rushworth, is on the streets, a familiar story for her brother. Numerous occasions I'd see Susan out on the on the street or the lane, as I called it, you know, selling her, selling herself, and then I'd pass in her car, and I'd stop occasionally and just ask her to stop doing it, and she's seen that she's in terrible danger. You know, there must be another way, Susan, but she never could find a way to stop that which makes her incredibly vulnerable. Griffiths leaves his flat. He spots Susan. Will he attack? Or will he casually approach her and invite her upstairs to his flat? Susan knows Griffiths, a fellow drug user. He may have had what she needs, or may pay for sex so she can use the cash to buy heroin. But it is a moment charged with portentous threat. Susan Rushworth's fate is no longer in her own hands. Stephen Griffiths has the defenceless Susan Rushworth at his mercy. In his flat, axes, hammers, sharpened swords. On the walls, posters of his serial killer heroes. Has he drugged Susan? Does she lie prone, powerless? Until now, he's only read about serial killers. In public, he is odd, but no threat. This is his big moment. His target meticulously selected, and he's alone with her. I think when Griffiths was with a group of individuals, he probably presented very little danger because, of course, the chances of him getting caught are very, very high. He'll commit one offence, he'll get caught and he'll go to prison. What he did is he chose his time. He chose the vulnerable. His victimology was very much about choosing those where he had power and control over them. It was only when he was on his own and when he was in a position where he could offend that the real Stephen Griffiths came out. He makes his decision. He couldn't have chosen a more vulnerable young woman. She's very addicted to drugs. She has no one around her to protect her. She's, um, for all intents and purposes, living rough, um, needing every bit of money that she can to sustain this habit that's killing her. But it's not her habit that kills her in the end, but rather this, this very, very sick, disturbed man. 
Griffiths has never fully revealed the horror of Susan's ordeal, but security cameras installed in his housing block captured him carrying out refuse bags. What was in them? A few days after she disappeared, Griffiths is captured on security cameras. He's shown carrying bags, and we now are pretty sure that her body was in there in pieces. As far as what happened to Susan, we're not 100% sure. He just admitted to killing Susan with a hammer. And he's, Griffiths has never said how he's disposed of Susan's body. I don't think he ever will. I think it's, the, it's still got some kind of power over us by not telling us what's happened to Susan. 43-year-old Susan Rushworth needed a friend that night that she ached to feed her heroin habit. Instead, fate had sent her into the hands of Stephen Griffiths, a man determined to kill without conscience. Why, why did you feel the need to, to kill her? I don't know. I don't know if I'd say just if you kill someone to kill yourself or kill parents. I don't know, I don't know. Was it easy to spot those deep issues? Apparently not. Friends who knew Griffiths well just before he began his series of murders knew nothing. He was described by his confidant from university days as someone who could be a lovely man. Theirs was a simple friendship, uncomplicated. We'd never fancied each other. There'd never been that sexual attraction there between us. And I think I was safe. I was a safe friend. But even the safe friend was to see an aspect of his darker side. I never felt threatened or unsafe with Steve until I actually fell out with him myself. And then, and then of course, it was a different matter. I kind of started stepping, stepping back from him, so I wasn't seeing him as much. He contacted me and asked me to get something for him. And against my better judgment, I tried. And it didn't work out. And he took the off about it. And I lost my temper and basically told him some home truths. Was she in danger? Delia had no idea what she was dealing with. I basically told him that he was like behaving like a spoiled little boy who couldn't get what he wanted and you know that that people didn't want to know him and that he wasn't being very nice in uncertain terms. So he didn't take that very well. She had no idea that, that at this point, Stephen was actually thinking very seriously about how he was going to carry out a very violent attack, fantasizing about it, planning it. Steve started a hate campaign towards me. He phoned up on my landline a couple of times, threatening me. I got some nasty emails, to which I replied and basically laughed at kind of what he was saying to me and arguing back. It's amazing to think that at any moment he could have gone over the edge and she was right in the middle of that. Griffiths moved on from his former friend. It had been a lucky escape. Delia was never to see him again. Within a short time of the parting of the ways between them, he had begun his series of murders. Around this time, Griffiths is still learning his trade from his research for university, deciding who were the soft targets, how he could kill them, and he's learning from his heroes, especially about who to choose as victims. He had a desire to join the roll call of past killers. And who did he target? Sex workers, just like the heroes of his past. He is very clear about his adoration, his admiration for serial killers and for violence. He's going on websites and chat rooms. He's developing his own websites around it. He's, you know, being uh, aggressive in relationships. It's, if, if you were to have looked at it again, in retrospect, if you were to look back, you could almost see the clock ticking to him, you know, doing something irrational.
Would Shelley Armitage be victim number two? Shelley had been a bouncy teenager, again from a family devoted to her. Her sister remembers when things began to go wrong. Shelley sort of met up with the wrong crowd of people. She was only 16, 16 years old and just still so sort of vulnerable. Um, only just left school. You know, I didn't realise what impact this was going to have on her life at the time. It was a bit of being such a young age. Another heartbreaking story. This woman comes from, for all intents and purposes, what seemed like a very loving middle-class family, but gets embroiled um, in drugs. She just basically started sort of staying in bed. You know, my mum and dad could smell sick in her bedroom and we just knew, well, my mum and dad knew things just weren't right, really. Um, she just sort of started changing as a person from being such a lovely, bubbly, outgoing person to somebody that were just sort of wanting to stay in bed and just changed. The sisters were particularly close. Gemma dreamed of being like her gorgeous elder sibling who seemed to have everything going for her until she became addicted to a poison, one which would make her one day vulnerable to Stephen Griffiths. She got involved in heroin, um, which at the time back then, it wasn't um, something that people were aware of. It was sort of, it's when the drug hit, like Bradford really. People wasn't aware of the damage it was gonna cause. Um, no one was keyed up on it. Nobody knew what it was. Um, and, you know, it led from probably just three times that she ever took it to her getting addicted to it, which caused her to then end up having to steal, you know, to fund her habit, really. Ends up having to um, work as a sex worker to sustain her habit, becomes extremely vulnerable. Late in April 2010, Gemma and Shelley spoke, the family always ready to help. We always spoke on the phone, always. We, in fact, I spoke to her on the 26th of April that day. She called me um, that afternoon. After that conversation, Shelley has a choice to make. As ever, she's welcomed back home with her parents or with her sister. Instead, she chooses the best way that she knows to feed her drugs habit, to earn money from selling her body. She heads for the area known to attract cab crawlers, the area that Stephen Griffiths has made his home. As she stands on a cab looking up and down the road for a possible customer, Shelley Armitage is getting anxious. But there are no signs of business. Someone is watching her. From his vantage point, Stephen Griffiths has spotted her. He descends the stairs, walks along the corridor of his block of flats. He's captured by security cameras, leaves the building. This is who he's preying on. He's preying on the most vulnerable people he can find, and that's who he finds. Griffiths approaches her. Within seconds, Shelley Armitage has become the latest woman to enter the lair of a serial killer. Again, he has never revealed precisely what happens next. To the outside world and the family who loved her, Shelley simply disappears. The day Shelley disappeared, uh, her boyfriend made the initial phone call to the police to sort of say that she'd not been home. And um, my dad was then informed by our li liaison officers went to see my mum and dad to sort of inform that she was reported missing. Back then, that phone call really, in all fairness and honesty, I didn't think would lead any, nowhere near to, to what happened. You know, I thought that she might have just gone off on one, be somewhere. I don't know, I, did, I thought she might have um, just been with some friends. I didn't, I didn't read into it anywhere. I didn't read into it at all. It worried me a little bit, but, you know, this has happened before. We've, we've had sort of experiences like this before. So I just thought she would turn up. But she would not turn up. Griffiths has killed again. It is likely that within minutes of entering his flat, Shelley has become victim number two of Stephen Griffiths. But again, the nature of his victim's life means that no one knows. It wasn't until maybe sort of a week into it, we then started to realize things were not right. Um, she'd not claimed her benefits, which was out of the ordinary for her. 
She, um, she didn't collect her methadone, which is the medication she was on um, through the drug problem. Um, so then we were sort of realising then that there was something sort of not right. Gemma set off on a one-person crusade in search of her sister. She was to uncover a desperately sad turn of events. She spoke to other women who were working the Bradford sex trade. Had they seen her? I'd drive around the streets day and night, um, asking the same question to all the girls up there, but none of them just could give me any answers. None of them, you know, they were all, they were all just as shocked and wanted to know where she was as much as me. And they revealed a bitter, tragic irony. Someone had tried to rescue Shelley from the streets that night. Each evening, a charity in Bradford patrol the streets of the Red Light District. They're looking for people down on their luck, people working in the sex trade who might need a hot meal, a warm drink, a bed for the night. A short exchange almost certainly witnessed by Stephen Griffiths as he spied on his latest prey. In his own mind, he's on the way to emulating a hero, creating his own reputation. Shelley Armitage's life ended the night she entered Griffith's flat. We'll probably never know how he killed her. It could have been a crossbow, he might have used his swords, bludgeoned or strangled her to death. We just don't know. Those who later investigated Griffith's behaviour established other ugly truths. Griffiths is cutting up his victims' bodies, keeping some parts back, and then throwing the remains into the nearby River Ur. I think what Stephen does here is, is for most people beyond comprehension. He doesn't just, just kill this young woman, but he, he cuts her up. He puts parts of her in bags to dispose of like garbage, and then he keeps some for himself to, to have as, as a kind of trophy. It is April 2010, and Stephen Griffiths has now killed twice. Who would be next? So is this the end of the story? I think very much in this case, it's just the beginning. It's now about ensuring that he's a serial killer. He needs to do this again. He needs to do it in a similar way. He needs to build up this persona that he's planned for so long. Suzanne Blameyer's life story is again of a woman from a respected, hardworking family. Suzanne Blameyer's was Bradford born and bred, trained to be a nurse, but then she fell foul of drugs. So by now, two women had gone missing. Nobody had made a connection. Thrown out of college, Suzanne's life entered a downward spiral. She would become another vulnerable sex worker doing what she could to get the cash to buy drugs. She fitted the tragic profile of victim that Stephen Griffiths would target. And one night, after seeing her chatting to another sex worker, Griffiths decides that Suzanne will be victim number three. Again, unwittingly, Suzanne makes it easy for him. She works the streets adjacent to his flat. He approaches her. He's on home turf, dangerous ground. It's an area where serial killers have preyed on sex workers before. It's the place where the infamous and appalling Yorkshire Ripper cruise the streets. And of course, where Griffiths lived. He sees her, invites her to his flat. Desperate for money, Susan Blamers walks back into Griffith's flat. She knows it's dangerous, but she decides to take the risk. What she does not know is of Griffith's armory. He has an arsenal of weapons, including one which can kill at the squeeze of a trigger and which he lawfully owns. Lethal, but a perfectly legal weapon. He kept it in fantastic condition, oiling it, and practicing with it in the woods outside the city. After killing first Susan Rushworth, then Shelley Armitage, Griffith's bloodlust was up. As they returned to Griffith's flat, it is likely he tried to put Suzanne at her ease. Other sex workers he approached spoke of how he would at first seem calm, easygoing. Griffiths opens the door, and inside within a moment, Suzanne will have seen the weapons that he has adorning the walls. On his walls, he had samurai swords. He had books and shelves of books on serial killers. It was like a den of dark arts. Given his violent criminal record, should someone somewhere have known of his dark fascination with lethal weapons? Not necessarily. 
I can tell you I've been to many people's addresses who have guns, who has knives, who have all kinds of violent equipment there. And there's actually no evidence, and there's never been any, that these people go on and commit other offences. So the fact that he had a crossbow in his flat would not have indicated in any way that he was likely to have used it. Uh, because, of course, you know, the majority of people who have these weapons, they don't go on and commit any horrendous offences with them. The small minority do. It's not a criticism you can necessarily apply to the police, the fact that he had these weapons. Uh, that nothing was done with them. Suzanne Blamire's, therefore, is part of a scene where Griffith's behaviour remains unchecked, unsuspected, as she arrives in his flat. She may wish to leave, but either because he does not let her go or because she still does not know the level of danger that she faces, Suzanne remains in his flat. She's done this before, had sex with oddly behaved men. She's always been fine, walked away with the money that she needs to buy drugs, she holds her nerve, takes a few more steps. Griffiths has done this before too. Sometimes he's had sex, other times he has subjected the woman to an ugly ordeal of intimidation. So he degrades them, he treats them very badly, very violently. It's almost as if he's finding a way of dehumanizing, he's finding a way of relating to these people as their controller, as someone that has all the power over them, as someone that takes pleasure from their pain. On some occasions, he uses that control to allow women to go free. But sometimes, he kills. It is after midnight. Which course of action will Stephen Griffiths decide upon as he eyes up the tiny Suzanne Blamires? What is about to happen to Suzanne Blamires will become all too clear to investigators. Griffiths had a secret past. Management at the housing project where Griffiths worked installed cameras because they'd heard of the prison sentence that he'd served. The cameras captured Griffiths' comings and goings. They're about to record a horrifying ordeal. Stephen Griffiths is no stranger to drugs himself. He was a heavy drug taker. A lot of prescription drugs, um, uppers, downers. So he'd have something to get himself up, then something to get himself to sleep, ecstasy, speed, and then later on, ketamine as well. His dependency on drugs puts him in a half world of reality and of imagination, one he reveals online. The other thing that we see during this time is, is a real obsession with violent imagery. In fact, he designs websites that are uh, solely uh, concerned with, with crossbows and with, with killings, with murder. Very graphic content, very violent content. This is something that he's surrounding himself with. Why is he surrounding himself with this content? Is it about playing it through in his mind before he does it? Is he becoming, does it give him a sense of comfort? Is it about a plan? Is it about establishing the identity? Is it about practicing before he does it? The fate of Susan Blamires is now in the hands of a killer, one for whom savagery has become the norm, online and off. She realizes that she's in danger and makes a run for it. He follows, armed with the crossbow, into the corridor where he knows there are cameras. The security camera was pointed in his direction. He must have wondered, is it switched on? Will the tapes be checked? I think what Stephen does here is, is for most people beyond comprehension. He doesn't just, just kill this young woman. Suzanne Blamers was shot through the head. He actually made a triumphant gesture at the camera after he killed her. And his method of killing, almost certainly he had loaded an arrow into his crossbow and fired at point blank range into her head. After he kills, he actually goes out of his way to be seen on camera. He's beginning at this point to want to imagine himself, how he's seen by other people. He's beginning already to imagine how his crimes will appear, how he will appear. So it's an establishment of an identity he's been actually seeking for a very long time. More gruesome behavior was to follow. Stephen Griffiths will soon reveal himself not as simply a killer, but as a cannibal. He will dismember the body of his latest victim, 
he will devour body parts. When checking the contents captured on security cameras, a guard sees the horrific events which have unfolded and reports to police. Griffiths is soon arrested. This has been arrested on suspicion of assault, assault, assault. He mumbles a need for a drink. It's all very routine. And then the interrogation begins. Far from trying to hide the truth, Griffith slowly begins to reveal slivers of it, careful to talk about only what he knows detectives will probably discover. For example, that he'd set fire to part of his flat. What were you setting things on fire for? Well, to destroy DNA. But like I say, in such a reckless, crazy manner, I can't believe, mind you, I don't know, I think, like I said, caretaker perhaps had other things on his mind, but otherwise I can't believe, you know, with the, the smoke that must have been billowing out of the windows. Although I did keep them shut for a while as well, so that's why I got a lot of soot all over me, and eventually I got a breathing mask on. Ever the gloating expert, Griffiths at times talks like a PhD research student. So, how would you know that fire destroys DNA? Well, to be perfectly honest, I mean, that was something I always kept uh, meaning to check up on on the internet, but um, it was just an assumption that, uh, well, certainly I think the principle I operated on was, well, it certainly isn't going to enhance the quality of the evidence. Police become anxious to uncover the whereabouts of the remains of the girls to help the families gain closure. Griffiths keeps back this information, a means of control. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? And now, uh, where a robot, where a computer would put them. You know, a rational, emotionless, Aberration would put it. What, why did you feel the need to to kill her? I don't know. I don't know if I was, so just I should kill someone to kill yourself or kill parties. I don't know, I don't know. That's like deep issues inside me. <laughs> So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Mm -hmm. Ben? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. Griffiths reveals just enough to establish to police that they're dealing with a multiple murderer. He's still hiding much, but he freely confesses to the killings. He was very open in an awful lot of his killings, the way that he committed his offences, um, and he'd almost thrown in a towel. But I think at that point, he'd reached his notoriety, he'd got to the point where he knew he couldn't continue any further. And as a result of that, by giving up and offering the information, it enabled him to go down in history like some of his other people that he's followed, for example, Peter Sutcliffe. He will have known that he was being recorded, suspects are normally told, and Griffiths uh, regarded himself as something of an expert in police procedure, and he would have been playing up to the cameras. Many people will know about Peter Sutcliffe. How many people remember his victims? But of course, that's what happens. You remember the offender, not the victims. And you're more likely to remember the offender if they come into custody and tell you the gravity and the gruesomeness and the horrific nature of their offending. And this is the point where he begins to hold court. This is something that not only has he studied for years, but rehearsed in his mind. He, he actually plays around with the investigators, saying things like, you know, you should have caught me sooner. It sure took you a long time. I mean, think about it. There was smoke coming out of my apartment when I was cooking these bodies. Why, why didn't you find me sooner? I can't believe, mind you, I don't know. I think, like I said, caretaker perhaps had other things on his mind, but otherwise I can't believe, you know, with the, the smoke that must have been billowing out of the windows. Although I did keep them shut for a while as well, so that's why I got a lot of soot all over me and eventually I got a breathing mask on. Seemingly relaxed and drinking tea, Griffiths 
reveals a string of revelations. Apparently, he had uh, a stove in his flat in w with which he would cook the victims. He goes into meticulous detail, probably as a means of, of showing them that he can remember that he did engage with all these details, therefore he is in control and he is able to give this to them. But also because his agenda has always been not just to be a killer, but to be a notorious, infamous killer. And if he's going to be that, they need to know that somehow he was special and different and pushed the boundaries to the nth degree. So he tells them about these details. He tries to shock them. Griffiths plans one last triumph, a final act to fulfill his ambition to become not simply a serial killer, but one who will find a place in the hall of infamy. His day in court offers him that chance. He gives himself a name, a mantle, like his hero, the Yorkshire Ripper. So what's this final act that will allow him to, to be a part of criminal history forever and ever? Of course, it's to give himself a name, a title. And where does he decide to do this? In court. When he's asked for his name, he stands up, and very calmly introduces himself as the crossbow cannibal. When he said he was asked to give his name and he called himself the crossbow cannibal, was just, just disgusting, really. You know, it was heartbreaking. We'd already been through enough, and to have to listen to him say something like that was just horrible. Um, I thought that I was actually hearing things at first, and it wasn't until I looked round at everybody else that I realised what he said was true. Um, everybody was just shocked and. It wasn't until then then I sort of realised what a real sort of Jacqueline Hyde person we was dealing with here. The only real issue related to Stephen Griffiths for the following court case to consider was his sanity. A psychiatric report had described Griffiths as psychotic many years earlier, but the court found that he knew precisely what he was doing. Griffiths consciously decided to kill again and again. He was sane enough to cold-heartedly pursue an ambition. Stephen Griffiths achieved his ambition to follow in the footsteps of the men he so admired, the murderers to whom he built a shrine. In this age of celebrity, young people dream about being celebrated for their accomplishments, for singing, for dancing, for acting. He wanted to be celebrated for his accomplishments, but as, as a serial killer, so he sought infamy more than fame. Stephen Griffiths became a rare inmate in Britain's prison system. The judge ordered three life sentences to be served concurrently with a whole life tariff. He will never be eligible for parole. <laughs> 